card on the screen. And there we go. We're live now. Uh, so welcome, Janet. Um, you're calling in from Portland. And uh, sorry, why don't you sort of go ahead and cover an introduction. First of all, thank you for doing this and giving us the opportunity to learn from you. Um, why don't you go ahead and give us an introduction about what you do, who you are, about your organization. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. It's wonderful to, to see you all. Um, so I'm Janet Edmondson and uh, in my professional life, I'm a speaker and a trainer on topics such as positivity and performance in the workplace and unconscious bias. And that's under my company name, JME Insights. And I have a master's degree in education from Georgia State University. I live in Portland, but it's the Portland, Maine, Portland. Uh, Actually, Portland. Yeah. Um, I have over 30 years experience in worksite health promotion. That was my career for many years. And just delivering uh, wellness programs for corporations all over the, the U.S. Yeah. My caregiver experience, though, came when I was the care partner to my late husband, Charles. He had uh, what we found in his autopsy, um, an atypical Parkinsonian disorder uh, called cortical basal degeneration. And, it, and a major part of his disease was ataxia. He had a uh, loss of uh, control of his bodily movements, um, especially his ability to walk. Uh, he, his ability to talk uh, over time. Early on was the problem with his fine motor movements. He couldn't tie a tie or zipper a zipper. And um, it affected his eyes as well, the movement of his eyes. So he couldn't track across a line. So he lost his ability to read. He was an avid reader. So that was tough for him. And his ability to write. I mean, all of those things that many of your folks are, are probably aware of. Yes. In addition, though, with his disease, he also had um, co some cognitive issues, uh, not dementia like Alzheimer's, where it's um, uh, memory loss, but it was more cognitive and behavioral uh, losses. So we couldn't add two plus two and three plus five. And this is a guy with two master's degrees and all the coursework for a PhD. Very smart, but the disease just took away um, that ability from him. So his ataxia was part of his overall disease, cortical basal degeneration, um, but looks very much like what many of you are facing with your loved ones. Um, I wrote a book and we'll, we'll talk about that later about our experience called Finding Meaning with Charles. And um, in 2007, I started doing my speaking career, the training and, and um, speaking that I talked about earlier. Um, so, um, you do a lot of things like your trainer, motivational speaker, uh, health promotion professional, an entrepreneur. How did you get started? You know, started in that, in that career came way back when I was in the seventh grade and I just loved gym class and I decided I wanted to be a, a physical education teacher. When I got that degree, I realized, and I don't know so much if I want to teach kids. Uh, in a classroom, but I did start a career at the YMCA um, and worked there until I got into the work site. I just kind of fell right into the worksite health promotion field when it was very early in that in the worksite health promotion field in the late oh 1990 oh, no 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 1970s 1980 really is when that started. So I just kind of fell into my professional career. Um, now, um, what I should probably add that most of the people who are going to join us today uh, will probably be people with a taxi and not necessarily caregivers. I think there may be the odd caregiver, but it's always good for us. Maybe, maybe um, what we hear gives us another, maybe it's, it gives us another way to talk to the caregivers around us, or we can introduce them to your information, whatever. Um, 
So you yeah. wrote a book about the caregiver or about your caregiver experience finding meaning with Charles. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So um, I never wanted to write a book. It wasn't in my list of things to do, but my late husband, Charles, did want to write a book. And once he got his disease and his abilities were really moving quick, by the way, it was a five-year progression for him. So he had a very, you know, quick moving neurological disease. Uh, he died in the year 2000, by the way. So two or three years into his disease, we realized that things were not going well. And um, I said, Charles, what do you want to do before you, you know, before this thing makes it so you can't do something anymore? And he said, I want to write a book. He already had the title for it called Paradoxes of Leadership. And he'd been speaking about this in his business world. So he already knew what to do. But by the time that uh, he was ready to write. He couldn't physically write. So we had a lot of people helping him. Bottom line is he was able to write that book and I was able to see that process. And what happened to me to get me to want to write my book was um, we had hospice for the last year of Charles's life. And I remember the hospice nurse saying to me one time that, you know, I was going through this so in such a positive, upbeat sort of manner. And I said, well, how else do you get through something like this? Um, I don't want to spiral down into depression. That's the only alternative I can see to be in positive. And she said, no, she said, you're, you know, you're fairly unique. This is not always the way people go through it. And so that made me think, maybe I have something to share in writing a book on how Charles and I actually did keep uh, a positive attitude, not, not without being sad, not without crying, not without... Uh, really grieving the losses, but still, how do we give him the best rest of life as possible? So that's, I started taking notes, uh, you know, a few years into Charles's disease, and then after he died, I took the time to, to write. I thought the story might be helpful for others. Um, what were the biggest challenges you found in writing him? Well, I'm not... I'm a writer in health promotion. You, I can write about how to exercise, how to do stress management, how to eat right. I didn't know how to write about my feelings and I didn't know how to write our story. So I joined a couple of the, in the town, one of the towns of uh, writing groups, uh, memoir writing groups, and they really helped me. And we had a little side group that got together every week and I'd read and they'd give me, they'd say, well, what were you feeling? <laughs> and I'd have to write about that. So the challenge for me was just getting the feelings there, but with their help, I feel like I did it. It was a long process, uh, six years total, three years to write it and three years to figure out the publishing piece, but uh, got it done. Um, were there any insights you uh, gained? from you know, the process or from writing the book? Yeah, it's interesting. People said, did it help you, uh, did it help you uh, get through the loss of Charles? And I don't know any other experience because this is the experience that I had, but um, I really felt like when I was writing, I was connecting with him again. And so it was really very um, inspiring for me. However, when I went to my writing group and I actually read a chapter, I would just bawl <laughs> because that's, that's when it would hit me. Um, so I think in writing it, I really was able to see in this process of his disease, lots of hopes and then them get dashed. Then we come up with more hopes and then they get dashed. So it was just that roller coaster of um, trying to get through in the best way we could without losing our, our optimism. And we really did, even Charles really did fight to um, keep positive throughout. Uh, it was important for him. And I, I really got a lot of comfort from, um, I'm not religious, but got a comfort from the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I just think that's so wise um, for how do you get through things. So when things were tough, we tried to change what we could, but otherwise we had to learn acceptance. So that was part of the, of the learning. Right. Uh, now, 
to continue that, uh, being a caregiver can be full-time job. How do you um, persevere or and not want to give up? And how do you maintain your enthusiasm? Yeah, I, the attitude, as I've kind of mentioned, is we just try to give Charles the best rest of life possible. Now that gave my life meaning. I was still working full time. I was in my late forties. Charles was 50 when he died. So he was in his late forties as well. We still had a lot of life to live. And yet it was very impacted by his um, ataxia and the other parts of his disease. So we just tried to make every day meaningful. What, what did he want for that day? And when I was able to give him a meaningful experience that helped me feel meaning as well. We were lucky um, while I was working full time, he had a great um, disability insurance policy. And with that, we were able to get aid so I could go to work. Um, we had aids for him at that point, but when I was home at night, it was me and over the weekend, it was me until we were able to bring in some more aids. Um, so having help really does help. Uh, not everybody is fortunate to have that. And that's where I like to encourage as you guys go back and talk to your loved ones that are your care partners, encourage them to accept help when friends and family um, offer it. Because so often it's so easy to say, no, that's okay, I'm fine. But uh, it, you don't realize you need your help, the help until you get the help. And then you say, wow, that was really great. So say yes to help, tell your care partners to do that. Um, what do you feel is unique about the caregiver experience? Thinking about that, I think um, caregivers often get to serve their loved ones. And for me to serve Charles, I, I, I haven't really told you about Charles. He was a phenomenal person. Uh, he was loved in the business world and where he worked. He cared about his employees. He spoke about... Um, uh, really including people and being a part of that, building people up. So it was easy to want to give him um, the best as possible. So to serve him for me was really one of my biggest blessings. I think the other thing, and you may have noticed this, you all with your care partner, there can be a closeness that you get when you're dealing with a disease like this. The closeness is something you can't, someone else can't understand unless they're going through it. But once you're going through it, there is that connection that you're dealing with something very heavy and hard, but together you get through it. And I think that's another unique thing about being a caregiver. Um, I like how you mentioned care partner before, because I think that's an interesting distinction yeah. Oftentimes we can use the word caregiver, right? Like this is someone that's supposed to be giving us something and we're not supposed to give them anything. Whereas a care partner is more of a symbiotic relationship, right? Yeah. So that sort of leads into the next question. Um, what what can we do to support the people who care who are care partners or caregivers um i think one of the biggest thing you can do is thank them um charles's disease i mentioned had a cognitive component and charles was never capable after he got the disease he did this all the time beforehand but after he got the disease he was never capable of saying thank you there was something about the cognitive piece. Um, I knew he felt thankful, but he wasn't able to articulate that. So articulate that to your loved ones, your care partner. Just tell them thank you. Um, I would also say communicate your needs. As a care partner, it's very hard to know when you want help and when you don't want help. So where, where I struggled as a care partner was I would see Charles needing help, but I didn't know whether he wanted it or not unless he, unless he told me. And I'm one of those, I'm gonna give, give, give person. So I'm gonna try to help him. 
uh, and when he may not want me to, for whatever reason. So communicate when you want the help and when you don't want the help. Um, and just know that it can be frustrating for the caregiver when they see you need help um, and you don't allow them to, but have that conversation. Hey, I want to try to do this myself. I appreciate that you want to help me, but I'm going to try to do this myself. Also, um, be stubborn to the point where that you're doing as much as you can, but don't be so stubborn to the point that you don't accept the help when you really need it. For instance, when there's a deadline, you got to get to an appointment. That's the time to say, okay, just help me, right? Don't, don't put you guys so late that now everything's stressful and, and awful. So do as much as you can, as long as you can, but under certain circumstances, there is a time to say, okay, even though I can do it, it might take me twice as long and we got to get going. And so that'll help reduce their frustration. But the most important thing is communicate. So they know what you need, you know what they're gonna provide. Right. And maybe if there's an important appointment, consider that they have other stuff going on. Maybe you want to tell them a day or two ahead of time. Yeah. Um, so um, we met, we talked about how sometimes like caregivers or care partners they aren't really ready to look for help, ask for help, like at least among their immediate circle. Um, what support networks are there for people to reach out to like on social media or on the internet or something or whatever? Yeah, so I love the fact that you've got this group for people with ataxia, and I'm sure everyone gets a lot of help and comfort, and you learn. I found um, people learn more from the support groups than they do from their doctors, pretty typically. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, one thing that I did uh, when Charles was sick, there was no support group for what kind of the group of uh, neurological diseases that his fell in. So I, saw, I started a support group. I started one locally and that was terrific. In fact, I've got uh, friends from that group um, that have been my friends now for 20 years. Um, I'd also say that um, when, I, when we were going through this, which was in the uh, late 1990s, Facebook and a lot of the social media things weren't up and running as much as they are, but now they are. So there's a lot of groups there as well. But I'd encourage you to look for groups where you can actually talk to people and, and then also do the groups where you're just typing information and you can do it 24-7 um, to be, to be uh, able to get through this. There's a, um, if you could let your um, care partners know, there is an organization just for care partners and it's called, well, and spouses. It's called WellSpouse, wellspouse.org. And I just wanted to pass that along to you in case your care partners could benefit from being in a care uh, partner group. There's also um, a newsletter, and I didn't write the address, but I think it's uh, Care Caring Today. If you look up Caring Today, um, you'll find that newsletter for care partners as well. Okay, great. Um, what what sort of advice would you give to uh, people? There are some people some caregivers, care partners who are sort of stuck in the middle and they're taking care of kids mm -hmm. as well as maybe, maybe, maybe their parents or whatever, or another older relative. Yeah. So um, let me, let me take two levels here. One is just general advice I'd like to give to um, new care partners. Um, so, and I hope you'll pass these along and th this actual advice is good for everybody, the person with the disease, as well as the care partners. Um, one of the things I think was really helpful for us is to look for the gifts, look for the things that are positive. Cause I know you'll find them. Um, Charles, one of the things I can say were the gifts that he found was getting closer to his two brothers. They were pretty estranged. Um, Char I'm Charles's second wife, and he had, after his first wife, 
and he separated and then divorced, um, his family was very religious and wasn't accepting of that. So they really uh, were driven apart. Uh, once Charles and I got married many years later, um, or a few years later anyway, we started to try to build those relationships back, but it wasn't until Charles got sick that, um, and with this neurological disease that he really developed a strong bond with his two brothers. So that's, that's one of the gifts. So look for the gifts. I know they're there. It doesn't mean that there aren't challenges, but look for the gifts. For me, it was those two, uh, two really best friends that I got from the support group that I never would have known had I not, uh, had to deal with this disease. I'd also say for, for you all and for care partners, plan a treat every day. For us, for Charles and I, it was frozen yogurt. So we go to the frozen yogurt shop and I buy him a waffle cone with chocolate on the bottom, M&Ms in the middle and chocolate on the top. He, after a while, he'd have to stay in the car. I'd bring it back to him. I put napkins from here all the way down and he'd get that cone and he had no eye-hand coordination and chocolate was getting everywhere. But that didn't matter. We loved it. So what, I had to wash his clothes, but we did that every single day. So plan a treat every day. I also think another piece of advice I give you is to tell yourself, both you and your care partner, tell yourself that you're doing the best that you can at any point in time. We're not always at our best. Sometimes we're stressed and things just are falling apart. You're frustrated, you're yelling, the care partner's frustrated, they're yelling. But at any point in time, we're doing the best we can. We need to get that time for a recoup and re, you know, regeneration and stuff, but just give each other grace. We're, we're doing the best we can at any point in time. I remember one time, Charles got into this phase at just yelling. And I thought it was at me and it might've been, or it might've been hallucinations. I don't know what it was, but one time I just lost it. And I just put my head in face. He was in a wheelchair at the time, put my face right in front of him. And I went, ah, how does that make you feel? And then I felt terrible <laughs> immediately. I knew I had blown it and I just apologized. And then I never did that again. But you know, at any point in time, you're doing the best you can, and we're gonna lose it. It's okay. Um, some other things that I, I think are important is, um, as I said, to accept help, and I wanted to give you an example about that. None of my, I have, uh, there are six siblings in my family. Uh, none of them lived near me, but uh, after a year or so of Charles's development of his disease, my oldest sister, contacted me and said, we're gonna start coming to visit once every four to six weeks to help you out. So what did I say? Nah, that's fine, I don't need you, that's okay. Thank goodness they didn't listen to me <laughs> and they came anyway. And uh, it was wonderful because my brother went around and fixed things around the house. I had a sister who married an Italian and she was a great cook. I don't cook at all. So each one brought their special gifts and uh, it was really wonderful. And then to have that, again, that connection that this disease brought to us was really helpful. So accepting help is really a key point for care partners, especially, but also for you. So those are some of the things. And then you're asking about um, the sandwich generation when you're caught between um, maybe a, a grandparent or a parent your current um, significant other and then children. It's a hard place. It's a hard place to be uh, when you're there. And I can just give you an example with my youngest sister and my mom. My mom's 90 years old. She lives in South Carolina. Remember, I'm in Maine. She lives in South Carolina. And um, my mom lives there and then my youngest sister lives there. And my youngest sister then had the responsibility of taking my mom to all her appointments and doing uh, all the things that she needed to do day to day, uh, week to week with my mom. Well, we realized that um, what was happening is all of us siblings, whenever my mom had a doctor appointment, the doctor said, 
all right, we're changing the medicine or we want to try this or that. All six of us, well, five of us were sending text messages to my youngest sister saying, make sure to ask this. And what about that? And she was just getting bombarded. What? And then she finally, we didn't know that she was at her wit's end, but she finally blew it. And uh, we realized we needed to change what we were doing. So we created uh, one person who was the go-between. We all gave that person information and every now and then she would give it to my youngest sister. So I shared that sh story to say every piece, you know, whether it's the older person, you, the, the younger people, every piece is a, is a different uh, issue. And even with children, it's really helpful to say what part do they want to play? in this, in what you're going through. What do they want their role to be so that they can provide that for you instead of making them be the person that always does, you know, the go and get your kind of things. What kind of meaningful things can you give to the, to the children? So it's, it's, I didn't have kids at the time. Um, so I can't, I can't relate to that. I, I did remarry and did get some kids with this new guy, <laughs> but um, with Charles, I didn't have kids. So I'm not sure how that would have worked for me. I know people in my group say they're very ha happy that they have the children because of the extra support and help they get, whether the kids are younger or older. Um, but they're also very sad that the kids have to see you going uh, and having your losses and your struggles. Um, where can uh, people find you if they have more questions or they want to find out about any live speaking events that you're doing? All right, so there's a couple of ways to find me. Um, I have a, uh, a, my, a redesigned website that just launched yesterday. So you can find me, the easiest way is go to um, affirmyourself.com, all is one word, affirmyourself.com. And you can find my books there and um, other things that I have. Also, I have a YouTube channel. So if you type my name in the search on YouTube, so make sure to type it right, Janet Edmondson, E-D-M-U-N-S-O-N. -S and you'll see that I have a lot of, uh, especially for your care partners, I have webinars that have been recorded on topics such as guilt, forgiveness, perseverance, uh, positivity, meaning, so those are available. And I think even people with ataxia will, will find uh, some of the information in those very uplifting and, and helpful. So that's my YouTube channel. You can email me. I love getting emails. Um, and my email address is Janet at affirmyourself.com. So those are ways that people can find me. Oh, and I do have a, a, a free webinar coming up in a couple of weeks for caregivers, but it will be good for anybody on sleep. So if you want to get to that, um, the link is tinyurl.com slash sleep for caregivers, all one word. So tinyurl.com slash sleep for caregivers. So I'd love to have you join me uh, and, and let your care partners know also uh, that I'm having that free webinar on sleep. Okay. So uh, first of all, thanks for, uh, for taking the time to answer all these questions. What I'm going to do now is allow everyone to unmute themselves and kindly uh, raise your hand and ask any question if you haven't. So I've, you can unmute yourself now if you want. Or, if it's easier, you can type your question in the chat and I can ask it. Anyone have any questions? Anyone? I do. Sorry, this is Mary Beth. Hi, Mary Beth. Hi, Mary Beth. Hi. I'll get my picture going too. Um, <laughs> one lady in my support group says that she almost feels like like care support for the caregiver is as important, if not more important. And, um, you know, just that that person take care of themselves. And I'm sorry, you might've mentioned some of this in the beginning, cause I was a few minutes late, but why do you think she says that? I have no, I've, I've been doing support groups since, uh, well, 20 years now. 
And I have known care partners who have died before their loved ones. So yeah. it's really important for them to take care of themselves. Also, if care partners are getting so stressed out and not finding time to rejuvenate, okay. they're not good for you. <laughs> So they need time. Yeah. And you, you, one of the things you guys can do is encourage them to take some time on their own, whether it's to go see other friends or to go read a book, sit on the beach, whatever. Just uh, give them permission for that. I see. Okay. Does that make sense? Else? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Anybody else? Um, okay. Well, I guess since nobody else has any questions, um, did someone say something? Oh, not... Someone typed something in the, th is it okay to, to leave your tie tied? I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like, yeah. <laughs> or don't even wear a tie. Um, did you hear that, Mark? Yeah, but uh, anyways, thanks a lot for your time, Janet, and uh, you're prob I'm sure you're probably busy. We'll let you go at this point. It was great to be here with all of you. I wish you all the best and your care partners the best as well. Take care and enjoy the rest Thank of your meeting. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.